All right. Uh, we're in. <laughs> we're here this week in science. The crew is all here. We have audio, we have video, and a new plugin for the Chrome browser. And um, yeah, so we're ready Huzzah! to do a show. Huzzah! We're going to do a show. Blair's going to go to a party, and we're all going to have a good night. Uh huh. Uh huh. Justin, that's your cue. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following hour of programming contains breaking news from the world of science. While this may sound easy, innocent enough to seem innocent, do not be fooled. Nothing in science is true. The Earth is not warming. It's cooling, and we need to burn more carbon more quickly to heat it up again. Man has never been to the moon. Though if you say this to Buzz Aldrin, do expect to get a full... Fist have been there, done that in response. Evolution is a lie invented by godless pagans. Not to be confused with many godded pagans who don't believe in evolution either. Stars are not distant suns, but fixed immutable objects. The earth is not round, and it is the center of the universe. There is no explanation for tidal changes. DNA is gobbledygook. Dinosaurs are making it up. Carbon dating, hocus pocus. Atoms, hogwash. Stem cells are made from dead babies. And... Smoking has never killed anyone. And despite everything you may have heard to the contrary, This Week in Science is coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's no one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Kirsten and Blair. Wow. Good science to you too, Justin. We are so glad back. we're on the air again. We are on the air. We are so glad to be here. And everyone out there, I hope you are ready to enjoy the show because we have all sorts of science to talk about. Science. What? What? I thought we were here to talk about baby pageants. No. <laughs> No, 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 that's not what we do here. We have science, and I have a whole bunch of fun stories today. I have stories about, let's see, what did I bring? I have stories about, uh, I can't, I'm waiting for my page to load. <laughs> Issues. <laughs> I have stories about, here we go, antibodies, things our ancestors said, and dating advice for men. Hmm. Yeah, Justin, what do you have? My goodness, I have, uh, I have, uh, th th this is another story about how these things that we think are human civilization driven ideologies, etc., uh, actually are related to the normal organization of a bacterial colony. Hmm. Mm hmm. Nice. Uh, I've got a story a headline I see here says, Nobody likes a fat talker. I'm going to figure out what the heck that's about. Water on the moon? Where did it come from? And it, could it be related to the water that's on Earth? Or is it different? We'll have an answer. I like uh, that story. This, I'm so glad you got that one. Yeah, and if we have I, time, uh, Buzz yeah. Aldrin was, has been being very outspoken lately about uh, the necessity of the colonization of Mars. Mars the fest destiny, baby! Buzz Aldrin is spreading the word. Awesome. Marzafest. And Blair, what did you bring today? I have a story about a new type of anti-venom. Very good stuff. Also, your dog may make you a healthier person. Hmm. More dog stories. Yeah. Didn't we do a dog thing a couple I of did. weeks ago? Yeah. And that was interesting. There's a lot of dog news coming out right now. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I just right. thought I'd go with the flow on that one. Yeah. Okay. I, we can yeah. go with that. All right. <laughs> 
Excellent. Well, then let us get to the show. Let's get to business. All right. Start out the hour. Oh, climate, how art thou? It is this week in the end of the world. I thought we hadn't really touched on the climate and, you know, the impending end of civilization as we know it. No, I'm just being a little bit um, sensationalist there. I am. I really am. Uh, but some really cool research has come out. Uh, res uh, researchers uh, a, an ice core from the Arctic Ooh, have it's Russian from uh, yeah, it's from a, a Russian lake that's actually the product of an asteroid impact, and the uh, the area also for whatever reasons, was free from glaci glaciation. So it didn't have the normal scraping and, uh, you know, the, the erosion effects that would have come about as a result of a glacier moving over the surface of it. So as a result, there is a very clear uh, sedimentary progression and a record that goes back 3.6 million years. 3.6 million years. And we did report on this last year. They had a report that came out uh, last year, very similarly from the same ice core, but that only went back about 2.2 .2 to 2.6 million years ago. And so this covers the last bit of the ice core. They kept drilling and they've gotten to the end. Three point, they, they've uh, kept, I guess, drilling down on the ice core. Yeah, mm -hmm. not very punny. Um, 2.2 to 3.6 million years ago during the middle Ply Pliocene and early Pleistocene. Now, we have evidence from other parts of the world that this was a fairly warm period of, uh, on our planet. Uh, during this period of time, the West Antarctic ice, ice sheet did not exist. Um, there, were, there are other things uh, that we know to have occurred in other areas of the planet. And so this is really interesting to go, okay, we know what happened down in the Antarctic. What happened in the Arctic? And so this evidence from this lake, which is called Elgugitkin, El which if you were to see it spelled, you would probably never figure out how to pronounce it. It's a lot of G's and Y's and T's. Very, very interesting. Uh, it's in the, in the northeast Russian Arctic, about 100 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. And uh, the sediments that they've looked at uh, show that carbon dioxide levels were very similar to what they are now, in, uh, in very similar. And uh, the temperature in the Arctic was a good 8 degrees Celsius, or about almost 15 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. Whoa! Yeah. Oh, that's a big shift. That's a yeah, lot of change. Yeah, a lot of change. So, um, so they're saying that the, the two poles, the north and the south, based on this evidence, there's some common history that's shared between the two, but a little difference in how quickly things changed and how they changed. And uh, it's very interesting to note that there was a major drop in Arctic precipitation at about the same time that uh, the the large northern hemisphere ice sheets started expanding and the ocean conditions changed in the North Pacific. So uh, it could give us some kind of clues as to what triggered the ice age that started after the warm period. So exactly what, what caused the shift from the warm period with high carbon dioxide to a period of, of cooling and ice. So anyway, it's um, it's very very interesting to note that uh, these authors are going back in time, and this is one of the purest records that we have that goes back that far from uh, the Arctic region. It's even I, better than stuff out of Greenland. And, yes, prediction. Yes, um, <laughs> climate change deniers. <sighs> yes, we'll see this and say. Global warming? It was warmer before! Yes, it was. It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, they, they won't go any further than that. But it yeah. was 
15 degrees warmer, 14 point something degrees warmer anyway. Yeah, 14.4, almost 15. About yeah. the same amount of carbon as we have in the atmosphere today. Now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which yeah. means that even if we stabilize the system, we're still not going to have stabilized the temperature because it's going to continue to rise. <laughs> we're already in. We've already bought the ticket. We're just about to go on the ride. Yeah, and ah! the... Uh... <sighs> so the uh, the the take home message from this is that uh, there's this the last paragraph from the NSF press release says the Lake E paleoclimate reconstructions and climate modeling are consistent with estimates made by other research groups that support the idea that Earth's climate sensitivity to carbon dioxide may well be higher than suggested by the 2007 report of the IPCC. Now is a good time to go into some you know, ancient history journals and figure out what the climate, uh, predicted climates were during the Plast Pleistocene era and, you know, for, yeah. for future purchases of real estate. Yeah, Who knows? Think... Central Canada may be a tropical wonderland. So. Oh, <laughs> really into this yeah, and I think bit. they did actually see some uh, really interesting uh, evidence, uh, fossil pollen evidence in the core that included Douglas fir, hemlock, oh, yeah. um, trees that are not existent in the Arctic in that area currently. So it definitely was a... a a completely different ecosystem at that time as well. Which is also interesting because then, if you don't have as much ice in the caps, you have a lot more moisture going about on the planet. So you could potentially have much bigger wetter storms, which is a lot more energy because there's more heat transference going on. But then uh, that's also when you get a lot of the flooding, uh, sea levels rising, rising. Yeah, there's going to be some fun, interesting a stuff. Different world than today, then. <laughs> it's <gonna be> tomorrow. <laughs> um, and then, additionally, in addition to climate, um, there has been uh, for years speculation about what caused the extinction extinction of megafauna on Australia, the uh, the continent of Australia, uh, New Zealand and other areas uh, that used to make up a, uh, a mega continent. Um, yes, this, uh, this area was called Sahul. I didn't, I didn't know that, Sahul, uh, this old, old area. Um, but anyway, new research has come out led by a team from the University of New South Wales and the University of Queensland and the University of New England, the University of Washington, published in the Proceeding of the National, National Academy of Sciences that probably wasn't humans because humans arrived uh, in, in the Australian region about 45,000 to 50,000 years ago and they started fires and it was thought that hunting and fires killed off the megafauna but an assessment of climate over the last 130,000 years and the fossil record um, you know fossil record going back over the past 130,000 years and the fossil and the climate going back 450,000 years that uh, the megafauna were probably already pretty much dead because of climate change before hmm. people got there. But then probably people hunted them and there were fires and yeah, people might have been the last straw to a waning small number of species that were left. Yep. Yeah. So maybe people didn't do it. Yay! Uh. <laughs> or maybe we did. And they just need to find the fossil evidences of us even longer ago. Killing them. I, this the is dangerous information. Why? Why? Because people are going to take this the wrong way. As in, it's not our fault about anything? I or... just feel like it's very easy to then say, well, if climate was to 
to blame for it before, then who's to say that some of the other stuff that we have killed wasn't our fault? Oh. I don't know. There's some pretty big evidence that we, we as humans, have killed a whole lot of species. Yeah. Actually, uh, I mean, this is... Yeah. I don't even understand this conversation, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> like, at least the planet that I'm living on, the planet that I've seen, I mean, I'm, I'm on a continent that, you know, I can't look in any direction and not see pretty much con, con totally and completely devastated habitats of what used to be here. We've mm -hmm. removed um, natural habitats from land on this earth almost entirely at this point. The little alcoves that it still exists doesn't include the same ranges and the same interactions that we've had before. So it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore, anywhere on the planet. Even in the oceans. We've hunted some of the largest creatures. Uh, we've polluted. It's a different planet than it would have been without humanity, and it means a massive... We're an extinction event. We're a meteor. <laughs> we're oh, a yeah. comet strike on this planet. We're, in a, we're uh, an extreme environmental change, climate change, before we created an extreme climate change. So that's already in the books. Really. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, we did some bad stuff to be here. But we're not going to leave just on account of that. Right, so. right. But I, I'd say it's not, it's not really that surprising, though, that it was climate change and not us back then because we weren't in these vast societies where we were overhunting and overproducing and all this stuff. Uh, we were just wild. Mm -hmm. We were more wild than we were more sustainable in the way that people were hunting and gathering. I, I don't think I wouldn't expect humans to be at fault for an extinction of a bunch of different animal species at that point in time. Yeah. So, yeah. But today we could totally do it. Like, we're can I actually? <laughs> I know it's not my animal corner, but there is something I wanted to bring up that is directly related to this. Okay, Blair's yeah. not animal corner. It's not my animal corner. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the. Western black rhino is officially extinct. Oh. Yeah. Wasn't it already? Yeah, it was I didn't like even last know. Week. No. So, it makes me so sad. That yeah. Was they killed the week. last one. Yeah. Uh -oh. And there's only 29,000 rhinos left in the whole world. Wow. Okay. That's well, not wanna... very much at all. Is it the <laughs> last rhino in the wild or any? Anyway? Um, no, I think they're gone, gone. The Western black rhino. So, so that should be the first thing we call Rhinos. It's not all black rhinos because rhino. um, I have two black rhinos at the zoo. <laughs> they still exist. But Africa's western black rhino is now officially extinct. Mm -hmm. So I just mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to mention that. There's 29,000 rhinos, rhinos remaining worldwide and that's including the ones in zoos. And that might sound like a lot of rhinos to you but it's really not. No it's not. Not for an entire no. planet. Not and that the many. Javan rhino is probably going to be extinct in the next few months, most likely. The really thing about stuff. this that really gets gets me is that this isn't just poachers. The people who work at the reserves that are supposed to be protecting the rhinos are actually complicit in this extinction. They helped the poachers because they were offered money and they they went for that short term gain as a po because there's they're in such poverty that they, yeah. that short term gain is so important to them that they lose sight of the longer term and the bigger picture. It's just not important. And that's the bottom line, is that it's not really their fault. And it's not even yeah. so much the poachers' fault. It's the yeah. fault of the people buying rhino horn because <laughs> One rhino horn can go for $300,000. Now, if I'm somebody who needs to feed my starving family, of course I'm going to kill a rhino. I'll be able to feed my family for the rest of their lives. Wait, how much can if I no, get? $300,000. And you say there's two of them at your zoo? <sighs> Justin. Justin. Don't even joke about these things. <laughs> no, okay, okay. But the <laughs> thing is, no, I totally agree with you. Actually, I totally and agree the, with you. The worst part is that rhino horn is made out of Keratin. It's what our fingernails are. It's the exact same thing. So the reason these things are hunted is because the rhino horn is medicinal or an aphrodisiac or something like that. And 
It's just keratin. It's just like putting fingernails in your tea. It's exactly yeah. the same. And if people stop buying them, people will stop killing the rhinos. That is the bottom yep. line. So, so everyone listening. The education has to take place. Somehow we have to cross, cross cultural barriers to be able to educate people that these wives' tales are not the truth. And now that we have scientific evidence, we know that there are not any magical properties and that there are pharmaceuticals that can do the same thing and do a much better job. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Maybe, the oh, is, this, is, this is good for the pharmaceutical companies. Oh, that's true. Yeah, they have millions to make. <laughs> they have but millions if, if to make. All of you, everyone listening, if you travel abroad, it is very important when you buy things at a marketplace or some anything that could be made out of anything, you have to ask what it's made out of because in a lot of these other countries, you could be buying rhino horn or snow leopard fur or any ivory. You could be buying any number of things and you wouldn't even know. And yeah. it's really important to ask what everything is made out of when you travel outside the country. Yeah. That's a great question. It's yeah, even except, good to know here. What's that made out of? Yeah, except yep. around here it doesn't make any difference. Like all the fake fur at the Burlington Coat Factory turned out to be dog fur. Okay, but how about you like, should look at all of your junk food? And see if there's palm oil in it. It's not palm oil. It's oil. Palm it's oil palm. kills orangutans. What? Yeah. The harvesting of palm oil kills orangutans. So almost all of that delicious junk food that you guys eat, your Doritos, your Oreos, all this stuff, palm oil, one of the top ingredients. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is stop buying stuff with palm oil in it make some sort of outcry, and they'll use a different oil. It's fine. Other yeah. oils would work fine. Yeah, and, and, but, and this is kind of the point we were making before, though, I think, which is like the, the poachers and the guys who are on the front line who have some money to make to feed their families have a uh, pretty insurmountable decision to make. Um, and it's, you know, the, the first world criticism of making that decision when... It's our Doritos that are killing orangutans when it's our, you know what I mean? You go down the list, it's our cars that took out the, the ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's like, eh, it's a, it's our people purchasing, have a negative impact it's on the a, planet. It, it's, yeah, it, it's all over. It's our purchasing of paper towels that are, you know, uh, devastating, devastating. Glad you didn't say toilet paper. <laughs> I, I don't use no. You can buy recycled toilet paper, you know. Ew, of course, it was they're being used? devastated because of improper uh, foresty practices. Sweet. Yes, I'm gonna be quiet now. All right, no, this is our, look at what you buy. Bottom look, at line. What you, look at what, look you, at buy. what you buy. It makes a big difference. Think about what you're doing. How about that? How about that yeah. for one? And if we Justin. all stop buying palm oil, the price will drop, and then many more industries will start using it in the third world because of how ex inexpensive it is. Maybe palm we can convince them also, that greasy already... palms are a good substitute. <laughs> palm cheap. oil is already really cheap. It's like the cheapest oil. That's why they use it. That's why they but use it. they have to clear cut rainforests to do it. And um, there are other things that are affordable that don't have palm oil in them. All right, I'm going to be quiet now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's not animal corner. There's an environmental <laughs> rant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Justin. <laughs> do you have oh, a rant, I, Justin? No, I, I, no, I have no rants today. All right, I have Justin, no rants, thanks. but I do have. Awesome. I've, okay, so this is the most interesting story, probably the bunch that I've got here. Uh, water that was found on the moon. Uh, is uh, is examined from samples returned by the lunar crews of Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 dispel theories that comets delivered the molecules of water. Not not comets, not comets. They say, mm -hmm. yeah, but in fact, uh, they're saying it can the water on both the moon and the Earth are consistent with uh, uh, meteorites. Chondrites, I guess. Okay, so meteorites, chondrites, that's fine. So the moon and the earth were bombarded at the same time. Yeah. Right? 
That's what it looks like. Is that what, is that what it suggests? Yeah. So, which is interesting. Okay, which makes sense because this is our close neighbor, right? So, here we go. To find the origin of the moon's water, researchers looked at trapped volcanic glass, which is a melted inclusion. Surrounding ovine crystals prevent the surrounding ovine crystals prevent water from escaping during the eruption, providing researchers an idea of what the inside of the moon looks like. This uh, back in 2011. Uh, led researchers to, to uh, they found that the melt inclusions have plenty of water, as much in fact as lava forming on the Earth's ocean's floor. <laughs> That's extremely fascinating. They aimed to find the origin of that water to do that. They looked at isotopic composition of the hydrogen trapped in these inclusions using the Chemica Nano Sims 50L multi-collector ion microprobe at Carnegie. Researchers measured the amount of deuterium in the samples compared to the amount of regular hydrogen. Deuterium is hydrogen that has an extra neutron. Water me molecules originating from different places in the solar system have different amounts of de uh, deuterium in it. So, looks like, in general, things formed closer to the sun have less. Those further out uh, would have more. They found that the deuterium-hydrogen ratio in the melt inclusions was relatively low and matched the ratio of the meteorites in the asteroid belt near Jupiter and are thought to be among some of the oldest in the solar system. That means the source of the water on the moon and therefore on Earth is likely primitive meteorites from the very, very early age of the, the, uh, the solar system. I think it's so crazy. To, the, the thing that is crazy to me is the idea that there are giant things blasting the Earth, Earth's surface. There's mm -hmm. big bombardments, and the surface of the Earth is super hot. The moon is hot, and somehow all of this water trapped as gases inside of these chondrites has held the, it held the and that's what made that's how there's water on the moon and then somehow beyond that how there is such a massive amount of water on our planet yeah it's crazy it's crazy and it's also sort of well it's again i think it might be a strike against panspermia if all of our water now it doesn't mean necessarily the life on the planet it could still have been comet and origin and that sort of thing but if the water from the planet earth the frozen material came from meteorites that formed relatively closely to the sun it would take out that sort of idea of some inter-solar system comet that was meandering around dropping off life here and there Right? Right, right. This is sort of, a, this is, this whole project, at least the water on Earth and is a pretty close uh, to home project. Hmm. I like, I like home DIY projects. That's yeah. Nice. This That's whole good. Uh, life thing has uh, so far been a do-it-yourself effort here on Earth. Yeah. So, um, Blair, are we going to do a real animal corner right now or should yes. we go to the break? Let's do it. <laughs> Blair's Animal Corner! For with, real! Yeah, works at a zoo, likes a bow, yeah. and the band is a squirrel. Dang. Okay, alright, so let's start with our spider toxins. Oh, I love spiders. So, there's these things called reaper spiders. That's right, I said reaper spiders. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. In sure. Brazil, that are responsible for a lot of accidents, about 7,000 human accidents every year. Um, it's a very dangerous venom. So, researchers in Brazil, in the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais in Brazil, <laughs> found that they were able to engineer a protein that could potentially be an anti-venom for these spiders. Now here's a really cool, what's really cool. Usually in order to create an anti-venom, you have to get 
the animal that creates the venom. You have to somehow milk the venom out of them, and then you can develop an anti-venom from that. The other way you can make an anti-venom is to inject the venom from this animal into other animals. <laughs> they get sick, and then you can extract the antibodies out of those animals. Well, in Brazil, they were able to engineer a protein in the lab with no venomous animals, with no animals getting in injected. <laughs> they just were able to combine some proteins in order to protect against the toxin in the venom. Okay. However, however, I mean... Yes. Awesome. Super awesome that they could do it that way. But it required the whole history of having done it the hard way to know what to even do to orchestrate, to build this protein. That Yes, but now they're saying from this new... From this day forward. From this new procedure, they can look at a very small sample of venom. Or they can even look at genetics of an animal. And they may be able to then extrapolate an antivenom from that in the lab. So this new method could potentially totally change the way we do antivenoms in the future. That's really cool. Yeah. So And they've tested now this protein on rabbits. And all of the immunized animals showed an immune response similar to the way they responded to the toxin. And the engineered protein actually blocked the venom action from this stuff. <laughs> so they were they were protected from the skin damage and hemorrhaging from the spider bite. That's really neat. So yeah. So it'll just be a matter of so they've got the they now have this anti venom. It's been produced right. in this really new way, which could right. go on to help create other antivenoms that we don't have yet. And so now we know that it works in people, that it's uh, actually... Well, it, it worked in these any, rabbits. In the rabbits. <laughs> it works in rabbits. Yeah. It doesn't, didn't cause them any additional problems. So right. Right. hopefully it can be transferred to humans and right. we can manufacture a lot of it and it'll get to people all over the place so that they can use it. Yeah, then, and then so part of the problem the is having it on yeah. hand, right? Exactly. So if we can engineer this in the lab, that means we can constantly have new quantities of it, and we can also potentially come up with ones that have a longer shelf life. Because that's the other thing about antivenoms. They don't last super long. So a lot of the time, if I get bitten by a snake somewhere and they don't have, they usually won't have it exactly where I'm taken to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They might have to fly out some anti-venom. Somebody could die by then. Right. And yeah. so, especially in these other, in countries other than America, which is where most venomous animals live, it's in what? other here? places, oh, okay. other places besides here, it's even harder. If you're in Australia in the middle of the bush and you get bit by one of the most venomous snakes in the world, Getting you to a hospital or getting antivenom to you is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's also really interesting is I know there's been huge advances in antivenom in Israel because when I was there, they have, I think, seven different kinds of venomous snakes, but 97% of snake bites there are by this one type of snake, the Palestine viper. But there's maybe 10 different subspecies. And they actually have come up with antivenoms that are subspecies specific. Hmm. <laughs> See, but you've got to bring the snake with you. Extremely well. That's cool. Well, you have to have these snakes on hand. You have to milk them on a regular basis of their venom. And wow. then you can develop the antivenoms from the venom. Mm -hmm. Which also, like I said, very short shelf life. I think it lasts like a week. Oh yikes! So it's it's a problem. So if they could if they could figure out a way to just make it in the lab and beyond yeah. that make it in a way that lasts longer, it could totally change the way we treat animal bites, which is pretty cool. And it could put a lot of snake milkers out of work. 
Yeah, that's the other thing. But you know what? I think... I forget what the percentage is, but most snake milkers have been bitten at least once by a venomous snake. It comes with the territory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of terrifying. I think they might be okay with not doing that anymore. Most of them. Yeah, I could do something else, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try a different line of work. Yeah. <laughs> And then this is just a little lighthearted thing that I found today is that having pets or having dogs specifically could potentially help reduce your risk of heart disease. Cool. So the American Heart Association put out an official statement today. And I'll read you exactly what the statement says because it's very ambiguous and I don't want to insinuate anything that the American Heart Association does not want to say. So here's exactly what it says. Pet ownership is probably associated with a reduction in heart disease risk factors and increased survival among patients, but the studies aren't definitive and do not necessarily prove that owning a pet directly causes a reduction in heart disease risk. It may simply be that healthier people are the ones that have pets, not that having a pet actually leads or to or causes reduction in cardiovascular risk. Two, dog ownership in particular may help reduce cardiovascular risk. People with dogs may engage in, engage in more physical activity because they walk them. In a study of more than 5,200 adults, dog owners engaged in more walking in physical activity than non-dog owners and were 54% more likely to get the recommended level of physical activity. Three, owning pets may be associated with lower blood pressure and cholesterol levels and a lower incidence of obesity. And four, pets can have a positive effect on the body's reactions to stress. So the leading scientist said, in essence, data suggests that there probably is an association between pet ownership and a decreased cardiovascular risk. What's less clear is whether the act of adopting or acquiring a pet could lead to a reduction in cardiovascular risk in those with pre-existing disease. Further mm -hmm. research, including better quality studies, is needed to more definitively answer the question. So basically, they found a correlation. Now it's time to find the causation. Right. But it, ma it makes nothing but sense. If you're taking care of an animal, you're probably going to take care of yourself. Right. If you have an animal that more. has an energy requirement, you're going to have to expend some energy to do that. And time and time again, we see animals that help reduce stress and reduce anxiety. Mm -hmm. So having an, an animal around that cares about you and that you can pet and calm yourself down could help your heart be healthy as well. Makes sense. Yeah. I I think it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I got on that. So your dogs are helping you, everybody. And I imagine that a cat could help as well. Yes. Maybe not in the, quite the, cat, the same way, but yeah. The cat and the less obesity, maybe not so direct because you don't really have yeah. to walk a cat. But the stress reduction but I would say, from that yeah. loving animal. Yeah. As long as it's a good cat. As long as it's a good cat. Exactly. All right. Be a good there cat. There is no such thing as a good cat. <laughs> They're all oh. vectors for Toxoplasma gondii. You are so biased. All They're right. They're vectors. They're disease vectors. That's what they do. We, we know you think this. All right. It's, it's, it's science. It's time. It is science. And it is time for us to take a very short break and to come back after that. So I hope that everyone out there sit. Stay. Stay. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a well few done. moments. Thank you. Anyway, it's 
time for us to talk. Um, Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000. That's a lot of tens. Over 100,000 audiobooks in their library, all sorts of genres. Twist has enjoyed many science-based books over the years, thanks to audible.com, and we hope that you would enjoy their service as well. And so we have a deal worked out with Audible where if you sign up for their service, it doesn't cost anything for you to get started, just sign up, they will give you one free audiobook download. It's very exciting, right? You can choose whatever you want. They're not going to tell you what to listen to. Whatever you want, it's yours if you sign up. And then we get a kickback. So sign up sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist that's right audiblepodcast.com slash twist sign up right now and help us out also if you want to help us out in some additional ways we have merchandise available in our online store you can head on over to twist.org and we have a link on our website that goes directly to our Zazzle.com store. So go to twist.org, click on that Zazzle link in the menu bar and start buying hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, Christmas ornaments, whatever. Start buying now. Also, uh, Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors we need to hire and fun things we try to do and we appreciate any amount that you're able to give if you're able to give two dollars two hundred dollars two thousand two hundred thousand we're not going to be very picky we'll take whatever you've got and we will put it to good use supporting the show you make this show possible so we accept donations through paypal and we've made it really easy by putting pink PayPal donation links, little buttons all over our website. Go, so go to twist.org and you can either on the right sidebar find a PayPal donation button or you can go listen to the most recent episode, read the, the show notes, go down towards the comment section. There are more PayPal donation buttons down there at the bottom of the page just for you. Honestly, we do. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do this without you. And for those of you interested, a new five-week online course offered on NanoHub U. From Atoms to Materials, Predictive Theory and Simulations will cover the basic physics that govern materials at atomic scales. The, store, the course starts March 13th. For more information, go to nanohub.org slash you. That's nanohub.org slash you. Let's get back to the show. back with more this week in science that is right and we've had so much fun so far with lots of science uh blair was talking about anti-venoms and fun proteinaceous stuff before the dogs at the break and so i have to throw out about um antibodies a couple of stories uh, a really neat one out of the technology review mit's technology review there is uh, potential treatment for me for migraines. If you suffer from migraines, you know that they can be very debilitating, and some people suffer th from them several times a month. The cause of migraines is, as of yet, unknown. We don't really know exactly what causes it, causes them, and they they come in many different forms. But uh, it has been determined that there is a protein that seems to be related to the development of migraine symptoms. And this, uh, this protein is the CGRP. And uh, so this research uh, lab, uh, Alder Bio Biopharmaceuticals, they're testing a antibody to CGRP. And uh, it seems to be having some amount of success in its uh, in its trials. So, so far, uh, 
study of blocking CGRP with, anti with other drugs reduce headaches but have other problems associated with them. And so Alder Biopharmaceuticals has developed this antibody which is very specific. It goes right for the CGRP. It doesn't, it, it's not non-specific in that it would hit lots of other stuff. It just goes straight for that protein to block it and it could possibly be a much safer method of getting, uh, of blocking CGRP's actions within uh, within the brain and the blood system. So it's a, and the, the other aspect to this that's really neat is they're not using mammalian cells to culture the antibiotic, which is something that is normally used for antib antibody production. They're using yeast cells to do it. And the benefit of that is that yeast reproductive times are way faster than mammal cell reproductive times. So um, this could potentially develop the antibody and get it uh, produced more quickly, more rapidly, more drug more quickly, potentially means that it could be cheaper. Uh, but currently the price uh, to get effective antibody treatments out to market is a lot more expensive than the most expensive migraine drug. Huh. So there's definitely going to be a cost barrier to getting uh, getting it out there, but it could be the kind of thing that if it works, right. and it seems like it should, it would be you'd go get a shot once a month and you wouldn't have any migraines. And it's also one of those things that's cost uh, ineffective before you do. The first yeah, yeah. Prius ever built was, you know, $2 billion of research. <laughs> it was a $2 billion car if they just made one. Uh, they kept making them. And they kept making them. Therefore, yeah. They're like somewhat affordable, yeah. Right? And it and so yeah. Once they if they can prove uh, efficacy, they can you know do another trial or two. They can get the manufacturing process down. They can you know start to pump this out, and it can be it can take over. Maybe even cheaper. If something works better. It can become cheaper quicker. This is very then, exciting for me. <laughs> is it, do you have migraines? I do. And once they start, if if you don't catch it right away and take painkillers, mm -hmm. I if I like am at work or something and it comes all the way in, there's nothing I can do but close my eyes and put on like a cold compress and just go to sleep. There's no way wow. to fix it. Wow. That's yeah. So I'm mm. all for a migraine cure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's awesome. cure the migraines. Um and additionally there was a study um that is out, let's see, where is it published? Do, 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 do. Let's see if I can find it. Ah, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. A vaccine for heroin that is being developed. Researchers are, once again, developing a vaccine that is uh, related to heroin in that it develops and that it causes the body to develop antibodies to the molecular components of heroin so that when somebody, or they didn't give it to people in this case, but they gave it to rats, when the, the vaccine was given to rats, if the rats got a dose of heroin, they had to take a lot more of it to get any response whatsoever. So it blocks, it, it effectively blocks the effect of the drug. Um, so these rats were trained to press a lever. Like if they saw a light, they'd press a lever to get heroin. <laughs> and so with or the vaccine, rats. yeah, but the, the way this test, yeah, little junkie rats, exactly. Little junkie rats in laboratories all, all, all over the world. It's a sad, sad thing. Um, these, these rats, the way this experiment was set up was so that um, they could pull apart the psychological um, craving from the actual effect of the drug. And so even though the vaccine was effective against the drug itself, it uh, did not affect craving. So after they got the, the vaccine, if they saw the light, they still went to press the lever, but they had to press it a lot more times before they actually got the effect of heroin. And so for people, this could be really scary 
because they, you know, could lead to lots of overdoses and stuff. But it could be the, oops, I went off the bandwagon, but oh, gee, I shot up, but oh, nothing happened. So, okay, I don't need to do that again. So okay, maybe it could train people out of their... Well, okay, and wouldn't it be used so you wouldn't get your physical withdrawals, you'd just get your mental withdrawals, and then you could deal with your mental stuff while you were still on the heroin, and then you could transfer to physical withdrawals, like you could do it halfway. Wouldn't it be helpful that way? You could transition out of it a little bit easier? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've been told by the chat room that my audio is going in and out like the waves on a shore. Yeah. There's been a tiny bit of that, not a whole lot. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you got a slight <laughs> delay. Don't must go on. <laughs> Do I just need to turn myself up? I'll be louder. Maybe that'll fix it. Okay. So here's a story sent in uh, by one-time Twist intern and uh, frequent co-host Allison Depsky. This is uh, a yeah. this is a Pretty wild st story. It's uh, it's an art project that's currently going on at the iBeam annual showcase. It's part of an open studio presentation at the Clockwork or Clock Tower Gallery. Um, I think this is in New York. It's it's the work of artist Heather Dewey Hagborg. The project, the uh, art project, is called Stranger Visions. What she's doing is she's picking up random things that can give away somebody's DNA. Finding hairs, cigarette butts on the ground, chewing gum, <laughs> fingernails, yeah. anything she can find in public places, bus stops, restrooms, restaurants, wherever people are dropping DNA bits. Ew. She's collecting, she's doing a genetic analysis on this, punching it into a computer to get a very speculative uh, portrait of these of these people and then creating a likeness based on this genetic portrait. And, and I, I, I kind of like this idea. I mean, it, there's a couple of interesting, interesting ideas in here, right? One is the whole, like, well, that how dare she, you know, use somebody's DNA without their permission. But if you've left it in a public place, you've left it in a public place, so none of our DNA is secure in that sense. But I also like the idea of if you collected the DNA, not in random locations around a city, but right in the area where the the art studio or where the, the art exhibit was going to be, so you have all these faces on a wall, basically. It's facial reconstruction uh, that she's doing. And you have them all in the place where you found these stray bits of DNA. Some people walking by, be like, duh, 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 and it's like, wait, wait, wait a sec, that's that's me up on the wall. <laughs> what yeah. am I? How did I end up in this art project? What happened? It's a very interesting idea, and it brings up a lot of you know, it's an art project, but it brings up a lot of questions about what we can do to protect our the usage of our DNA as we. <laughs> lofted about the uh, public spaces we encounter. Truthfully, the future, it'll be, mm, we can't do it. Uh, yeah, I think that's just it, is that there is no control mm -hmm. over, you know, over where our DNA goes, how it's used. I mean, historically, it's just been, you know, swept up, mopped up, thrown away, no big deal, but, yeah. you know, but now the question is, could it be used for an art project? Could it be used for cloning? Could it be, you know, right. probably not. So here's the thing. No, no. But, like, we're to go a little bit further into the future than we can possibly envision over our immediate horizon. And 3D genetic sequencing printers. <laughs> cloning printers. Right? And all of yeah. a sudden, somebody's like, gosh, uh... That redhead uh, who just walked by, you know, that's what I'd like my kid to look like. I'm just <laughs> going to, you know what, I'm just going to clone her in my basement. Ew, and that sounds that's going to awesome. be my child. Ew. Because, no. or whatever. 
Like, it's very... Oy, there's a whole lot of consideration to the Pandora's box that's been opened there. Hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting. I don't know how I would... Like, at first I'm thinking, oh, it's fine, whatever, who cares? Yeah. But I don't know how I would feel if I walked into that right. and saw my face. Yeah. It'd be <laughs> kind of creepy. Wouldn't it? And there's also the whole, like, well, how good can you actually do a facial reconstruction based on a DNA sample? I mean, it's, I mean, even when we have an, an actual physical skull, we have the morphology and you have experts. I mean, how many versions of Neanderthal are there based on the same skull? You know, uh, you add the genetic di dimension, actually, you get a lot clearer picture because you can guess things like... And skin pigments and eye colors and that sort of thing a little bit better than you could. Uh, you can maybe indications, propensity, potentialities for obesity, or things like this, but it's you're still you still make it up in it. Yeah, I do have to appreciate Droid Noid's comment in the chat room. I think I'm a clone now. <laughs> There's always more of me running around. Oh, that's a, you gotta Think make that into a real now. song. That's right. That's totally awesome. That's I love brilliant. it. I love, yeah. Oh, yay. Props to that one. So here's another quick story. Uh, University of Notre Dame. The headline caught me in their press release. Nobody likes a fat talker. Notre Dame <laughs> study shows. What does that mean? Exactly. So here, I'm just going to read it here. Women who engage in fat talk, the self-disparaging remarks girls and women make in relation to eating, exercise, or their bodies, are less liked by their peers. A new study from the University of Notre Dame finds. Uh, this was led by, uh, led by Alexander Corning, Research Associate Professor of Psychology and Director of Notre Dame's Body Image and Eating Disorder Lab, which probably means she has an eating disorder. I'm just speculating, but I think that's why people go into that. Study was presented recently at the Midwestern Psychological Association Annual Conference. In the study, college age women were presented with a series of photos of either noticeably thin or noticeably overweight women engaging in either fat talk or positive body talk. They were then asked to rate the women on various dimensions, including how likable they were. The women in the photos were rated significantly less like, uh, likable when they made fat talk statements about their bodies. Whether or not they were overweight, this was separate from the physical critique of the women's bodies in the photos. Uh, the women rated most likable were the overweight women who made positive statements about their bodies. Though it has become a regular part of everyday conversation, fat talk is far from innocuous, according to Corning. It's strongly associated with and can even cause body dissatisfaction, which is a known factor for the development of eating disorders which I'm being misquoted now, but perhaps I suffer from myself. Although fat talk has been thought of by psychologists as a way women may attempt to initiate and strengthen their social bonds, Corning's research finds that the fat talkers are less liked than women who make positive statements about their bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I think is kind of interesting. Um, oh, she goes on to say, these findings are important because they raise awareness about how women actually are being perceived when they engage in this self-abasing kind of talk, Corning says. I, the only thing I kind of, like, a little bit disagree with her, maybe, like, or I don't know if it's sussed from this study, I don't know that that isn't a social bonding activity still. And though the person who you don't know who's talking about it, you may dislike them or think less of them for having talked about it, if it's your network who's talking about it, if it's a friend who's talking about it, you may like feel the urge to bond with them because you know them over something self disparaging. Because well, and was this study gender blind? Like, were the people? No, this was. Women. It was all women, right? Yes. Right? Yeah. It's women yeah. judging and women talking. Yes. I think that that's a whole nother thing to consider. Oh, because guys don't, I mean, there's, there's an element of this in guys, but we're not anywhere near, like, the spectrum disorder that you have. No, definitely I mean, we, not. <laughs> we, we encounter it. It happens. It does. It's a real 
thing among men for different reasons. Is you you look at the you know, people who are in really large families who had to fight over food, sometimes have eating disorders, that sort of thing. But dudes will like slap their bellies up, being like, "Yeah, this is I've I yeah, drank more beer different. over the years than you have." Woo. It's very different. Although it's I will say very... that just if you if you consider basic social positive um, ways of communicating and negative ways of communicating confidence is always good I have never heard of a situation where confidence was not a good thing to have in terms of social interactions, in terms of applying for jobs in terms of um, meeting new people everything about that yeah confidence is key and I think that if yeah. you if you indicate that you don't like something about yourself, that's the opposite of that. You appear weak, and then it comes down to this evolutionary thing where you don't want to associate yourself with weak people. And if yeah. I think I'm flawed, then I must be flawed, and you don't want to hang out with me because that's not a good strategy in life to hang out yeah, with someone who's flawed. That I think this is where I think I, I, I agree with that part of it when you're talking about strangers. But I think I, I think it is a, 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 an impulse of social bonding for women to do this because you're becoming vulnerable and exchanging that same self-depreciating information and sharing feelings with somebody you know. And I think that because I just because I've been on this planet long enough, I've heard women engage in fat talk. Like it gets sisters, so fast. Sisters <laughs> like dishing dirt about nothing else in the world and like oh I like I relate to you I understand I'm the same way I eat something it goes here it goes there it takes two weeks to even get it half of it away and it's like this really where like dudes never talk like that yeah I mean, like you know we never like yeah I was like ate a hamburger and I really regretted it because look at my butt like, well, that doesn't happen we don't do that <laughs> but I hear women do that a lot and so when she's saying it's like People think less of people who engage in that talk. I, I don't, but and it's not the social bonding thing. I think she's got it wrong. That's I think so she's. Funny. I think though, women don't appreciate that weakness in, in strangers. Mm. But I think it also depends. There's something that they're not referencing here too, which is if someone who is does not have. I'm trying to think how to phrase this. If someone who does not have their ideal body, okay is talking to someone who's very skinny and that person who's very skinny says oh god I need to lose a few pounds mm. makes you hate that person <laughs> <laughs> yeah I can do that. you're like I'm 30 pounds overweight you're 10 pounds underweight and you want to lose more weight screw you right yeah but I like the fact that both of you bought into some social norm like yeah. there's the right way to be without even having that be a context that was the given in the conversation well I think you know this is just proving that there's a there's a greater problem here which we already knew yeah this whole body dysmorphia thing is not good no it's and one of the things that I think uh one of the influences is definitely uh, your family as you're growing up. I know many women who do not buy into the body dysmorphia at all. They don't talk. They don't fat talk. They don't, you know, they don't even worry about it. They might have days where they don't feel great. They might have days where they feel awesome, but it's not something that is a, a constant topic of conversation, a way to bond with people. And uh, in fact, it's they're like, hey, I gained a few pounds. I look, my, my booty looks good in these jeans. Or, oh, I lost some weight. You know, I've been running, doing a bit more, you know, you know, whatever. They're happy with their body where it, wherever, it, wherever it is because they were given proper role models and mentored in the right way as yeah. they grew up. Yeah, although although I gotta say I think it's affluency and education play a big part of it too. I mean, you know, you you look at a town like Davis, and I hear the same fat talk in Davis, right? Very affluent, educated town. It's really it's actually kind of odd to see like you know an obese person in Davis. It's a pretty it's a pretty you know trim town. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, city over uh, Vacaville. Not the same story. 
it's really odd to see two skinny people in the same restaurant. And and I think you know, and I and yet you, the fat doc is still there too. Like, the, but the conversation sounds exactly the same. It doesn't matter. It really, it's it doesn't matter what your body looks like. It doesn't matter where you are, what social strata, what economic uh, strata. It has to do with how you feel internally and uh, what's okay to talk about. You know, like you said, Justin, maybe it's a it's probably a bonding thing. You know, when yeah. you're with your friends, you know, this is something you can talk about. Oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a lot of complaining that goes on. And there's been some, there have been some psychological studies that talk about all of the complaining and the talking, the talking, the talking that you do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually help you because it just wires those negative thoughts in exactly. to your brain. And so you just think more negative thoughts. And so right. you end up going into a worse place. And so if you're thinking thoughts about how uh, you don't feel good about yourself, how you uh, have too much weight on, you never do anything about it, what you're going to eat this thing, and that, 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 all just of a ignore sudden, it. you're not going to gain any... You're just gonna completely gain, ignore it. So that's you're going to gain more weight enough. because yeah. you're going to get depressed and then right. you're going to look for the good feelings in the naughty food that's going to make you gain more weight. So, right. so um, the... the, the the silver bullet here is love yourself, warts and all. Yeah. Gotta start there. Gotta start there, people. To do. Just, gotta, just gotta love you. I have problems you, you. with that myself, but it's really? something you have to do. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. your warts are like hardly visible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know. It's the oh, no. Everybody has something they don't like about themselves. The Everybody one on the bottom does. of my foot. I don't. <laughs> I don't believe it. I, Justin I, has a I, lot of self love. I don't. I really do. <laughs> I'm good. generous to my. I'm generous to other people, but I figure I should be generous to myself as though I was somebody else. That's and how actually, that I is am. that is one of the best things, pieces of advice that you can give Justin, because yeah. many people are harder on themselves than they are on other people, and you need to be generous to yourself. Yeah. Totally. Treat yourself the way that you would treat a stranger. I know what I like better your best than, friend. I, than I Whatever. know what a stranger likes. Treat yourself nicely. And yeah. I let myself have it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so moving on, I had another, uh, another study that was related to this a bit. Um, some dating advice. Ooh, ooh, I love I just somebody was typing. <laughs> Who's typing? I, I love this story. I read it. I love it. I'm excited. Let's talk about it. I don't know Let's what the story is. It. This story, all right, Stanford researchers, Dan McFarland and J Dan Jurafsky, studied speed dating and studied what makes couples click. So they looked at all the factors of body language and time that, uh, you know, people looking at each other and facial uh, looks, and they also studied speech so what they were saying to each other how long they talked and what uh what the aspects of the conversation were they found after looking at nearly 1000 dates that while there's a lot to do with body language and that you know immediate kind of like oh excitement or whatever within a 4 minute speed date words matter and that what you say to the other person actually makes a difference. And the results conclude that it's all about the woman. So men, if you want to date a woman, talk to her. Ask her questions. Tell her things about herself. Tell her that she's pretty. You look nice. Tell her things about yourself. Keep the conversation going. Be interested in her. That's what women like. That'll make you, mm -hmm. that, that'll give you the date that you're looking for. Because women are <laughs> incredibly selfish and self-absorbed. Yeah, and so, the other thing that I loved too was that the women loved to be interrupted by the men. With other questions about the women though. That's yes. the follow-up. Yeah. You have yes. to, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Go back to how brilliant you are because that's what I was really interested in. Mm -hmm. Wait, so you did what today? <laughs> oh my goodness, really? Exactly. How exactly. did you do that and become so stunningly beautiful all of a sudden? I, I don't know how you had time so to women, get dressed. This must uh, have taken weeks. 
like to talk about themselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so the researcher quick McFarland. Note, note, McFarland yeah, go quick note to McFarland. Um, <clears throat> men like that too. I mean. <laughs> but like, it doesn't matter because women are choosier than men. So men, within these dates, it uh, they basically were like, they liked more women than the women liked men. So the men, because they're not as choosy, have a higher probability of actually getting a date. Whereas women, because they're more choosy, are going to have, there's going to be a lot more involved in getting a date to happen. Yeah. Right? Like, and it's wow. not because the women are selfish. It's because they are they're high maintenance. choosy. Oh, choosy. Yeah, that's so, good word. May, may I point a few problems that I have with the study? Yeah. Just a few. Okay. So first of all, the sample. The sample of people that they looked at. Only college students, they were I believe. All, yeah. They were all college students at Stanford. Yeah. That's it. It's a very specific niche group, okay? A lot of high very specific. women. No, I have no idea. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, yes. it's an Ivy League school. Yes. It's college-age kids. There's a lot going on here that is not across the board, all right? This is very specific. My other issue is First that they're looking is, at what would uh, cause you, after a four-minute speed date, to want to go out with someone again. Let me interrupt That's you for not, a second. Let me interrupt I, you for a second. How, okay. This is, a, I think, no, I think it's a brilliant point you're making. I just want to know how you came up with it so easily, Justin. <laughs> I mean, it just, it was just right there. <laughs> I know it was hanging right in front of you. You had to take it, but yeah, my other, my other problem was that. Um, and that, you look amazing tonight too. Yeah, they're. Way. They're, oh my God! Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> that they're, that they're, the way that they're evaluating what would indicate a successful connection and what would not indicate a successful yeah. connection. Because men might be less choosy on picking a second date, but I don't right. know if necessarily men are less choosy in choosing a mate, like permanent. Did you, did like, you do done. something different with your hair right. tonight? Yeah. She's going Not to a really. party tonight. It's like this really so let Blair, down. It's like Blair, since yeah. you're going to a party tonight, her features, like, I think that you uh-huh, should expand uh-huh. the study group. <laughs> okay. Have your own speed dating right, conversations. I'll take notes. Let you let <laughs> yeah. us know which which guys that you talked to were more attractive uh-huh. and whether it had anything uh-huh. to do with the way that they talked to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're you're my uh, you're my single contact for science. There, so. <laughs> for science, exactly. For science. <laughs> this is for science. Oh yeah, and so I'll anyway. bring my legal pad <laughs> and I'll bring my pen. So let me just take a few notes on this conversation. <laughs> Actually, before you write anything down, before either you write anything I'm down, I just want to know what are your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, and on around about life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. What is, what is this uh, whole thing called life? Hmm. So I have a and... feeling if I brought a legal pad out at a party and started taking notes, the men would be getting a lot more choosier than me yeah. right away. Really fast. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness so um, shared stories indicated a sense of connection so sharing stories about yourself as did speakers who showed enthusiasm by varying their speech to get louder be more excited and softer you know bring the person in So you're mysterious now Kiki I'm interested thank yeah. you <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> it's very important to vary the way that you talk about things because you know that's what people I always do. found out that was a kind of a problem when I was <laughs> going to go on a date. This would never be fine if you didn't want to I don't know when you care. I'd be like, fine. I'd be like, okay, I just go home and like, you know, you know Mythbusters and watch All like, right. Justin, so, yeah. But then if you really would like to go out, it'd be fine. I would go too. I'm like, I have energy. I can stay. Uh, it's past 
you know. I might be needing. To... I'm feeling very choosy right now, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> very choosy. Uh, final so many... story that no, I... there's more than five. Oh gosh, I didn't even get to the best story. Oh, I'll save it for next week. Oh man. Okay, my final story is that uh, some. Researchers, we're always talking about researchers on this show. Uh, University of Reading in the United Kingdom, Mark Pagel, 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 I don't know how to pronounce his last name, uh, and his uh, group, his team, looked at uh, the world's languages and uh, spe specifically European languages to try and find an ancestral form of languages that we speak today. So um, our languages are united, some researchers believe, by super families. And so uh, what Pajel's team did was to come up with some statistics, basically some rules for how, um, how words might persist in a language over time or in multiple languages over time, or uh, what would lead to them uh, phasing out and turning into some other word. And so uh, they're looking at things like the, the P sound frequently changes to F and the F sound or the T sound to TH, TH, TH. So uh, the Latin word oh. pater, the P changes to F and the T changes to TH, your father, hmm. uh -huh. which we now have. Uh, so uh, we're, they're looking at several ancestral languages, um, several current languages, and then going back to ancestral languages that they know of and going even further back. And they've uh, traced language back 15,000 years, and they have come up with 23 words that are incredibly common across uh, languages today. Oh, wow. And it... It suggests that our ancestors were talking a lot about um, Sex. mother. They said they said they had mother in there a lot. Um, hand, fire, ashes, worm, here, and pull were shared uh -huh. by four different languages. Um, and there there were twenty three words in all that they that they looked at that were ultra conserved. Wow, that's a fantastic study. Yeah, so it's kind of neat to know that there are or uh, there are components of our language that can be traced back similar to the way that uh, mutations yeah. in genetics allow us to trace back uh, familial ancestry that now we're also able to trace back wow. language linguistic ancestry not nearly as far but you know there we're we're going back quite a ways and so it's it's really neat to say oh this is what people were saying and what they were talking about 15,000 years ago and oh this is who they were and this is what they did and yeah so you can start to put together a much clearer picture of our evolution Mother, you know what's so interesting is the fire. two examples uh, <laughs> the two examples that you had of um, letters transforming mm -hmm. they're both representative in Hebrew is P and F are the same letter huh. and T and TH are the same letter that's interesting they're the same mm -hmm. yeah Hebrew is a pretty ancient language though isn't it it's at least 6,000 years old yeah <laughs> yeah that's interesting. Very interesting. Although the, the oldest language, <laughs> uh, cool. the oldest written language, I guess, uh, turned into Arabic. At least Arabic borrowed the symbols for the written right. language. But it's for a society that is gone. Gone, Possibly. gone, gone. That's right. Well, I think it's time for us to get gone. Because it's quarter yep. to ten here on the Pacific Coast. Go. Blair go. wants to go to a party. So we gotta, we got to do this. On next week's show. For science. For <laughs> science with her legal pad. Once yeah. again, we're going to be here on Google+. Plus. Hopefully everything will work technically. Uh, we'll be using the on-air Hangouts. And we'll broadcast live also to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also follow us on the social media stuff. Uh, shout outs to Aaron Lore for fixing some stuff on our website. 
thank you. Getting things fixed, RSS feeds, website things. Thank you very much. Oh, is that my cue? Is that the part where I say, uh, we hope you enjoyed tonight's show? Twist is, of course, available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace. Twist, T-W-I-S, in the iPhone market thingy. And Blair, I think you should read this next one. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it. You go. Oh, all right. Well, I will update the end of the show for next week's show. For more information on anything that you have heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, twist.org. And we also want to hear from you, so email us. My email is Kirsten at This Week in Science. Justin, you can might be able to get a hold of him at Justin at This Week in Science, but it's much more likely that you'll get to him at twistminion at gmail.com. And Blair's email is blairbaz at gmail.com. But I think she also has a twist email now too, but I don't remember what it is. Yes, blairbaz at twist.org. And I'll read the Twitter part because now I'm caught up. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. You can also contact us on the Twitter at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, or at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. There's a topic you'd like us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview. Please let us know any of those various ways. So many ways. <laughs> and we will be back here next week. And we hope, us that, hope that you will join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science is the end of the world, so I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled, it says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice, show them how to stop the robots with a simple device, I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand, and all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just get understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy. This week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then Please just remember it's all in your head.
because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. Okay. All right. Flying out just reminded me yes. that I was supposed to talk about the difference between torpor and hibernation this week, and I forgot. So next oh, week, next I will week. talk about that. Okay. I think we're going to have an I interview promise. next week also with a okay. guy from Mother Jones talking about how robots are going to dominate our world in the future. Uh, kind of fits, you know, world robot domination. Kind of thought it would fit a little bit with the show, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about this guy, he doesn't have a webcam. How do oh. you not have a webcam? Uh, especially when you talk about robots. I know. That's like technology, right? You should have a webcam, right? Unless I don't know. I don't know. I just kind of expect everyone to have a webcam these days. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. 82 minutes a week. Thanks, Identity4. <laughs> So we went a little Shows longer this little week. Longer. Yeah. Uh, you know uh, what happened? We're not on KDVS anymore. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to do station breaks quite the same way we used to. I know, yeah. We're not, I'm like not as worried about the one-hour limit. <laughs> yeah, so, which is nice, too. We could turn this into a two-hour show and then claim a two-hour spot on some radio stations. There's, there's mm -hmm. lots of podcasts that have like 20 to 30-minute play. Yeah. Like, I don't think that's that unusual. Actually, you know what? I, I, uh, what's the word? Uh, less prefer. Like, if I'm looking for some content, I'm going to put it on. I Gord want it doesn't to have run. a webcam? What? I, I rate it by how long it is sometimes. What? Like, I could listen to this. It's a 10 minute segment, and then I'm going to have to, like, it's going to be over. They're not going to get into much detail about anything. I'm going to have to click another button, and it's not something I can, like, chillax to. I want like the two hour like science marathon lecture. That's Speaking nice. of which, where the heck did that go? That's nice. Okay. I think it's time for me to go. What? Wait, you can't leave. She's going yeah, to, go. to a party. You always stay. You always stay. Science. You always stay like really late and now you're leaving? Ugh. Alright, fine. Go. No, no, go. Be with your friends. You're young. Don't try the guilt thing on me. I've invented that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You're young. You know, this is your oh, time. Dear. Go play. We'll Go just, play, you know, child. Have a good time. We're going to just sit here and play a card game. Uh, do you have any card games I'm we can play? I'm taking my cards Kirsten? with me, so you can't play them. <laughs> do you have any card games we can play, Kirsten? I'm the only one that has the naughty card, so get out of town. Are you, sure? are you, are you, <laughs> you want to bet on that? I don't think you have it. You don't think I have it? You don't, don't think... Kirsten? Oh. Kirsten, what? you want to do a little reveal for her? What? Do you have a card game we could play? Do I have a card game? We could play Cards Against Humanity. Oh, we could! What? Oh, look at that! <laughs> Oh, yeah. Don't even need you anymore. Do we want to play oh, Cards Against that. Humanity? Oh. oh, Lord. I don't think I want people to know what a bad person I am. Yeah, see. <laughs> I can play this game. I don't want to either, but it's uh, out there now. It's out it's there. Been, it's been scrubbed. It's, the internet is free of all of that. No, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about, Cards Against Humanity. I've never heard of it before. Kirsten, what is this thing you're proposing? What? Good night, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you next week.
Yeah, we'll have an early end tonight, next week. It's early. It's 10, right? Whatever. Okay. Mm. Yeah, we're all going to go, I think. I'm going to go. Next week, 7.30 sharp. <laughs> yeah, and I will use the Google Chrome. Do never, never use Firefox. It's a defective browser. It has never worked for anything. It's worked for me several times, like for the last... Yeah, several times. Long and it's time. been out for a decade. It's worked several times. Okay. No, shut up. Okay, okay, let's go. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Person. Good night, night, everybody. Thank you for waiting for us to start ah. and sticking with us, watching the show. Really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. And tell your friends about us, right? Yeah, love tell you. your friends. Good night.